I'm Catherine Kingsley. And I'm Catherine Stone. And this is Contemplating Culture, a missionary walk through a secular age. Together we journey through A Secular Age by Charles Taylor, a book looking at the history and philosophy of how the world got where it is, and the impacts of our contemporary culture for us today as missionaries. And we're inviting you to join the conversation. Hello and welcome back to Contemplating Culture. Hello everyone. So we've been on a journey the last few weeks. We're currently in a chapter called Bulwarks of Belief. And we've been looking at three different elements that kind of held belief and particularly belief as followed by religion in place and how they slowly dismantled. So the first of these we looked at was uh, God is our defense against evil. And this is where we looked at disenchantment. And as we started to measure and organize things that the world started to be less and less of a mystery and it wasn't so much imbued with evil spirits anymore as such so we didn't need that protection against them and then a few weeks ago we looked at this next bulwark which is god founds and sustains kingdoms and peoples that our entire society required that god be real because that was what was upholding our society and we looked at uh, the french revolutions and all the kind of ways that that challenged this idea that the monarchy was God ordained, that society was held in place by God. So today we're looking at uh, the final bulwark, which he kind of talks about as God alone can move the cosmos. So we're looking at this one ordered, perfectly arranged cosmos that all has its pinnacle in God and how that over time has come to us understanding the universe and kind of looking at those two different things. And it's really fascinating because um, Charles Taylor says that the one thing that really drove this change was actually dissatisfaction. So that's what we're going to look at today is the power of dissatisfaction and how that started to dismantle things that led to us, yeah, kind of having the universe as opposed to the cosmic view of things. Great. Now, can I just let people know before KK starts breaking that open that we've got to the stage in her notebook where the cartoons are now all in pencil. So we're, you know, breaking new ground as we uh, go on. The rest of the book so far has been done in pen and, you know, well-finished cartoons. It, it's true. The um, the more podcasts we do, the more time is going into the editing and less into the <laughs> breaking new ground in the book. But Um, Hopefully it won't catch up with us too much. Okay, so tell us about this new uh, bulwark that's going to fall. Yeah, so it really starts with this sense of the cosmos. And if you are familiar with the scriptures, you can kind of get a sense of it. It's that, I mean, obviously that it was from a time that they believed in the flat earth with, you know, this dome over it and then the heavens and below that was Sheol and... God moved all the stars in place and kind of everything was in God's hand. Everything was kind of small enough and everything that had been created that was in this sphere of existence was ordered to God. The perfect order, all created things, all pointed towards God. So he kind of had everything, you know, reaching this pinnacle point. And that was obviously ended with eternity, you know, that all of this was held in time, but outside of time, you had the eternal God. And so the shift that we're talking about is the move to, well, we don't even need to really explain it because that's what we live in now is this sense of the universe. You know, the the universe is ever expanding. There's limitless possibilities. There's no one thread. There's no one way of doing things, of understanding things. It's kind of, you know, like, We're approaching the limitless. Anything is possible. It's scary. That's what it is. (laughs) Like this idea of more galaxies than we could even count. What is this world that we live in? And that's it. We live in this time when, you know, technology, science, they're creating more and more ways for us to understand, you know, how much bigger everything is. So one of the things uh, about Charles Taylor is that he loves telling stories before he tells you his point. (laughs) And so I've kind of gone through and I've kind of given all of his stories like a little name in my head just so I can understand them. This one I titled The Story of How the Old World Was Lost. 
And it's fascinating, like I was saying, because it doesn't really go down the line I thought it would. Like, it didn't really happen the way that I imagined. And this might just be his interpretation of how things happened as well. So we'll keep that in mind. But he is looking at this period of time and looking at the dissatisfaction that starts to spread through a very particular part of society. So obviously, I mean, when you're in a feudal structure, you've got people down the bottom that are widespread unsatisfied, but they don't really have the power to do anything about it. But what we start to have then is, and we see it with the French revolutions, I think, especially these educated few that start to then move to educate the masses. And so getting more and more dissatisfaction. So they're looking at, I guess, the things of faith as the holy people that have the inner prayer life and all those things. But my job, my job is to do the things. But then they start to encounter, you know, the human condition in these leaders in the church and they start to get really dissatisfied. Like, why am I following this bishop? Why am I following this priest? Like... He's got, you know, a secret child or a secret wife or whatever. He's abusing all the power. He's taking money, the whole area of indulgences, all those kinds of things. So let's call it the the dissatisfaction of hypocrisy in, in the leaders of the church mixed with, yeah, the education. And so we've got these two things. So you get to this point where the gap starts to widen between those who are in the church and holding to things in the church, things of faith, and those who have decided to start wandering off and looking back saying, you're just hypocrites. And we looked a number of weeks ago at the things that start to happen between two camps. And this is another one of those situations. So you've got those within the church kind of saying, well, like, we've got to be safe here because we're, we're the clergy are, you know. We, we're doing the right thing. So we must be right. So because we've got the ritual and the practice or the right things, we must be right. And then you can't have a good attack unless you're going to belittle the other party. So looking at the other party saying, you know, they're too inward focused. They're too, you know, just looking at what's going on in themselves. They just want their own private relationship with God. They must be heretics over there. Lay people having an inner prayer life. That's, and so you've got this kind of thing. And then this little island kind of floating away of these educated lay people starting to have experiences of God in a prayer life. And, and they look back at, at the naive masses and they're saying, well, you're uneducated. You know, if you became educated, you would understand that this is actually what you're meant to have. Looking at the way that holy objects were being used, almost a superstition kind of thing. And we've already talked like that's something that's falling in the world. You can't be superstitious because There is no, you know, underwriting evil spirits or good spirits. And they just look at popular piety as something really naive. So how are we going so far, Kat? Yeah, totally makes sense in my head. Okay, that's good. And so I guess the last last little bit in Taylor's kind of story that he's telling us is heavily tied into this is the idea of white magic and black magic, that the, the bishops, the priests... You know, they're the ones that orchestrate the sacraments. They've kind of got the power, I guess, over the sacraments. And that's where the, the good the good power is. So you should come to Mass and let them administrate the, the good, but also at the same time stirring up a, a real fear of of the, the black, the dark, the, the things out, you know, that's still keeping in you need us kind of thing. And then you've got this movement like I was saying, what's happening with our leaders? We can't trust them. We, why should we follow them? And eventually we're going to get to the Reformation, which is, well, actually, we can just have God. <laughs> why, are we have, why are we letting all these other things carry us when we're made for God? We can have God by ourselves. So we're, we're prepped and primed for that movement. Right. So this is like the beginning of the fall of this idea of God at the center of the cosmos. Because at this point, I can still have God. Yes. But I don't want the mess that the church is. What does that give me that I can't get myself? Yeah. And, you know, going back to our first episode, when we're looking at the marketplace, I guess one of the things that really 
defines this movement is that things are starting to be scattered. We've got lots of little pockets of ideologies of groups of educated people and they're all starting to say, well, I didn't actually need the church to be here and so maybe God's with me at this stall and maybe God can be here with me at this stall and maybe God can be here with me at this stall and so I don't need everything to be centralised anymore because wherever I am, I can have direct access to God now. I don't need the structures of religion. So this is kind of the story that Taylor's been telling. So what, what you're saying is that this marketplace that we've been talking about, this new idea that we have, it's not so new after all, that the first marketplace is way back here. The difference is that at this stage, the marketplace is all different ways of being in relationship with God. It's my personal take on how you can pray and understand God and the things of God and there's yours and there's that group of people over there and there's the hierarchical church which might have the biggest stall still yeah. and the, might still be the most popular stall but there's this growing group of other stalls which are attracting people. That's it and this idea is something that Taylor is going to talk again and again about. We're going to keep circling back to to this because it's so key to what it means to be in a secular age. But I'm actually really excited like over this journey that I think each time we go back into something, we'll have more insights and we'll be looking at it from a slightly different angle. Yeah. So I'm really excited for that of just like the ways that we'll come to understand even what we talked about, you know, six months earlier, I think we'll understand better down the tracks. But one of the things like, that we find is that this dissatisfaction, like once it started to take hold as something that could achieve change, you know, once there was power in the dissatisfaction rather than it being latent, it's now rife through society. Like we were talking earlier about there's, there's endless ways that you see it these days. Absolutely. And social media being my number one pick as to an example of, where you see the marketplace most clearly in yeah. the world today. Unless I stick my settings up so high that I only see the posts of people who agree with everything that I think. Yeah. I, I see a, a great variety of different ways you can be in relationship with God, different political opinions, different yeah. political opinions of people who have the same views about God, different um, views on how you should bring up your children, different... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like marketplace right in front of my face every time I open my phone or my computer and you're saying unless I change my settings and that would be I guess an expression of your dissatisfaction with being overwhelmed by the sources of input like some of the other ones that I think you can kind of see it in very similar is like the whole cancel culture Oh, I'm so dissatisfied with this person and what they're saying or this agenda or whatever that not only am I going to shut them out, but I'm going to encourage everyone else to shut them out. You know, that that's a movement of dissatisfaction. I see another one in the recent campaigns that happened in the Australian federal election that the teal independence kind of came out as a movement of dissatisfaction with the two major parties that, hey, there's these major issues that neither of them's looking at, you know, like, and suddenly we saw, we saw the power of the dissatisfaction here in our local context. We were talking a couple of weeks ago, Kat, and I don't think it made it on the podcast. I can't remember. But about the times when we feel so empowered as individuals, because we see this kind of thing happening, we see how much it's possible for change to happen. And we're sold this by the world that it, it should be possible. It should happen. If you're dissatisfied, you should bring about change. And if you don't, there's, I don't know, like a pressure or something, or you feel like you failed if you, you don't. And there's this sort of anxiety producing need to perform. Yeah. I cannot remember the end of that conversation <laughs> at this point in time, but I do think it, that whole dissatisfaction movement for all that it's supposed to bring us freedom. And maybe this is what we were discussing does end up in the same place that a lot of our conversations have ended up with anxiety of that sense that I should 
act on this situation and this issue and this issue and this issue because I have personal power to change the world. And if I don't write to my local senator and my local member of parliament, and if I don't protest about this issue and sign that petition and those kind of things, then I'm letting the world down. Yeah. And I don't. And then I carry the guilt of letting the world down that the reason that we have abortion legalized in this state is because I didn't write enough letters or sign enough petitions or protest enough days or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's out, it's out there. Dissatisfaction is out there, but dissatisfaction is also in us, like deep, deep in the heart of us. It's something that it scatters us, disperses us, maybe even confuses us. Absolutely. Like, you know, those days you come home and you're feeling restless and you don't really know what you want and you go into the kitchen and you open the fridge and you don't really know what you're looking for. So you close it and you open the cupboard and contemplate the chocolate on the top shelf for a bit for deciding that that's not what you're looking for either. And you wander restlessly through the house, kind of seeing what other people are doing, scrolling scrolling through Netflix, Facebook. Um, But there's this, this restless feeling, this I'm, I'm looking for something that I don't have yeah. and automatically externalize it. I, it must be food or it must be entertainment or it must be the right people in my life. And I can blame, you know, that the reason that I'm so restless is because we're not doing the right mission as sisters or because the people in authority have like limited my possibilities of exercising my freedom or whatever it is. And there's something more fundamental Mm -hmm. that it comes down to for me and it was such a victory when I recognized this dynamic in myself was that whole thing of Saint Augustine of our Lord our hearts are restless until they rest in you and that has brought me so much comfort (laughs) over time as when I'm able to process internally oh I'm restless and see that restlessness that dissatisfaction as a signpost to the one that I'm restless for, the infinite, limitless, fully satisfying God that the fullness of whom I'm not going to find that rest in outside of eternity. So I guess we're going back a few podcasts to that open door, reminding me mm-hmm. that the fullness that my heart is seeking is not here and now. But that signpost itself gives me a, a sense of security, a sense of, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Mm. I, I can live with the certain amount of emptiness. You make a really good point because I guess dissatisfaction has been in humanity as long as humanity's been around. And we see well we're getting it we're getting a picture of the different ways that we can choose to respond. And I guess that's one of the gifts of what we're doing, of looking at history. Because we can look at the different times that dissatisfaction has risen up, the different times it's been empowered, the different times and places, and we can actually decide, you know, like what kind of future we want, how we want to move forward with our dissatisfaction. So you've given us like a really good idea of one of the ways we can respond in that internal dissatisfaction is to lift our gaze from the universe back to even if we don't move to a flat earth model of cosmos <laughs> um i hope we don't because we love science science is invented by god but to the idea that there's something transcendent that, that the universe is not empty of meaning or significance that there's another realm of existence and not only that but it has a pinnacle it does have a point it's not endlessly expanding it's actually the opposite it It's all uniting in Jesus. Absolutely. That God, no matter if we can't use the same picture, is still holding all things in being. And so I guess within the church now, so we've looked at at us, within the church, there's also going to be dissatisfaction. Like our plenary council in Australia was a platform where a lot of people were able to express something of their dissatisfaction. And again, we can look at history and see the different ways that people have responded to dissatisfaction. So what is it? What is it that we're called to, do you think? Well, my kind of hero in this regard would have to be Francis of Assisi as a sort of standout model of 
choosing what I call both and Mm -hmm. that he chooses both that individual relationship with God that ultimately reforms the church and people's belief but he chooses the church as well so here's this humble man who is such a beautiful image of Jesus to us serving under corrupt priests corrupt bishops etc and saying not a word against them that his whole life if you like is a critique of how some people in his world and the church in his world were living but he chose to submit himself within that church and trust that the God who holds the universe holds the church and its future and it wasn't his role to decide how God was going to fix things Mm. but merely to be responsible to God for who he was called to be in his own sphere. Yeah, it's good. Maybe tell us a little bit more about how Francis, like what that looked like, what the reform of Francis within the church looked like. Because I guess we can know different stories and we might just associate him with nature and love of nature or we might have, you know, different images or stories that we have of Francis. But I think if we're really going to take hold of this offering that you have for us, yeah, is there a little bit more of, I guess we can understand now we've got a corrupt church now, we know that, even though it's always working for betterment. But what exactly did his reform look like? Well, I think first of all, it looked like a reform of himself. He began not with the church, but with his own heart Mm. and with his own heart before God. And in and out of that relationship with God, he then got mixed up in the church if you like Jesus who was capturing his heart said go rebuild my church and Francis you know it's a great story of how he took that absolutely literally and thought he had to start you know physically buying bricks and rocks and rebuilding fallen down churches which is not at all what God was referring to but that's how he started Mm. just in obedience to God this is God's church. God obviously wants me to be part of it. He's telling me to rebuild it. Um, so this is how I'm going to act. And there's something about the humility mm. with which Francis seemed to act, that it was always about obedience to God and as part of that obedience to God's church. And really the the unpacking of Francis's relationship with God as a reform of the church begins with the vision of the Pope at the time of, you know, the church falling down and being supported on the shoulders of this little poor man and the realisation that in this love of Jesus and this humility, this preaching, because Francis went around preaching repentance for sins (laughs) to ordinary people, that he, if you like, opened up this personal relationship with Jesus within the church within the structures of the church, you know, sent people back to mass, back to confession, taught them to, you know, stand within the truth that God gave us without judging perhaps the praxis, the way, the behaviour of those who were administering that truth. It's good. It's something really powerful for us to remember is that the efficacy of what the church offers isn't diminished you know, by the brokenness of the people that are in the church or even in leadership in the church. And that's not to excuse bad behaviour. I think Francis just recognised that his call wasn't Mm. to tumble down (laughs) bishops and priests or, or call them out in a direct kind of way. I'm sure that his life in itself was a witness that brought many corrupt priests and bishops back. You said something that is just, is so true, right? It starts with humility because the whole point is, it's like, I know my own brokenness. It's, we're not even just talking about tumbling, you know, people in authority who often are priests or bishops, but even just ourselves as representatives of the church, lay people in the church that we all need to know our need for God 
and then it comes back to what you were saying about Augustine, like when we're dissatisfied in everything we see outside, we need to see, you know, the brokenness in us too and just humbly bring it to God. And there's something, I don't know, just as you're talking about Francis, I just kept thinking, oh, it's it's not even about, you know, things being perfect or I need to get things to a certain place. Like he didn't operate like that. He just operated out of love. He just loved Jesus mm. and he was just obedient to the one that he loved. And that began with him. It began with him having a really personal, deep love for Jesus. And yeah, it's just so beautiful to think that, that that's the invitation. Like first and foremost is just fall in love with Jesus and being obedient to him. If he wants to do things through your life, he will, mm. but it, it comes through like the obedience that's born of love. Absolutely. And to, um, to just, prove I guess that I'm not, not out there for nobody should go and preach repentance to people who are being hypocrites um, another good example is Catherine of Siena you know she her heart is captured by Jesus she spends three years locked up in her room Jesus sends her out and she goes and serves him in the sick and the poor but ultimately like he sends her out to the church she's solving disputes between towns And then she's off to tell the Pope he has to go back to Rome. And then when there's disaster after he goes back to Rome and several anti-popes later, she's still working to reform the church. That God does move people, people who love him dearly, to act for reform of people who are behaving badly in positions of authority. And it's about knowing where your call is and I guess Catherine is another example of someone who acted with utter humility, that there was a fearlessness in her and what she was called to do. But it was a fearless, fearlessness born of the fact that she was being obedient. Mm. I guess one of the other things I'm thinking about is, like, whilst hypocrisy is a dissatisfaction that we have now, and it's obviously the one that Taylor says was a big player in this movement, you know, like five, six hundred years ago, that I think that there's some maybe other areas of dissatisfaction in our church at the moment, around our church, outside our church, on the margins of our church. The things that I guess as missionaries we're really aware of because it's often the reasons people we love have walked away mm. or often the things that people come to ask us, why does, why does the church hate this or not approve this? And there's so much dissatisfaction in that regard as well, like how how do we respond? How do we be missionaries in the dissatisfactions of today? Because I guess what we're learning from this little story in history is that the church of that time really doubled down and was pointing the finger saying, saying you're heretics over there kind of thing. We're safe here. And I don't know if that's necessarily the call for us right now. So yeah, like what is the call for us as church? Like do we want to go down that path again of kind of building a wall between us and those who aren't walking with us? Or is is there another way? Well, I don't see Jesus building walls. I've been listening on and off to a, another podcast called Rebuilders and the um, main guy in the podcast is a Protestant pastor called Mark Sayers who has just written a book about the world that we live in at the moment. And he talks about leadership in this world, church leadership in this world, as needing to be a non-anxious presence. And something that has captured the sort of call, I think, of how we're meant to be as missionaries in the church today, that I can stand in the gap between my love for God what I believe he's given us as church, as truth and somebody else's struggle and not be faced by it, if you like, that my stability gives them something to attach to because they receive from me love, care, respect, listening, etc. While knowing that I, I haven't budged from what I believe. You know what, Kat, you said uh, I didn't see Jesus building walls. But what he did was he built on a rock. And that's kind of what I can see in what you're saying right now is it's like we are to be built on a rock 
but with open doors, you know, not with walls around us, but with open space that others can come and spend time on the rock with us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I kind of see it. I remember somebody talking to my dad who was telling me this kind of analogy. And he said, there's kind of two ways of, of seeing the church. One is of like, and I can't remember the type of animal that they're calling, but like one that's covered in a, sh- in a hard shell. And like, there's a definite boundary of those that are in and out of the body. And one where like, more like the human body, where there's a, a concrete skeleton, if you like, that defines mm-hmm. the shape and of the body, but everything else is kind of attached to varying degrees to this skeleton so that you can be um, several degrees removed <laughs> from the skeleton itself and yet still attached. Mm. Um, and that perhaps that's a better picture of church. I mean, the ideal would be that we would all be super attached, but that there are some people who sit on the margins who need like me to be, is it, you know, the human body better than I do. What is it that attaches things to bones to me to be tendons, the, the tendons that hold them mm. to the bone structure that is this body. If you like that, they experience through me, the love of God, the something that their heart is reaching out for. And while they can't hold to all that I hold to as truth, while they're holding on to me, they haven't yet let go. And this is, really like our little image for the podcast the little uh, art is the same idea as what's on the front of a secular age the book by charles taylor it's a bridge um different bridges but it's the same concept and it's this idea that i don't know exactly how taylor meant it but i know when when i was deciding that that's kind of the image that i wanted it was this it was that we would be the bridges we as people of faith would be able to communicate with the world and the church that we'd be able to take what's happening in the world into the church and then back the other way we would be able to bring something of the stability you know the security that that comes from having the rock you know back into the world that we would be those those anchoring points and I know so many times in my life being that person people in my life have recognized it and when I least expect it, they come because they know that I'm not going anywhere, you know? Absolutely. And, and they sort of hold you to what their expectations of you are. Like I remember a friend of me telling me about her daughter who has walked away from faith. And yet one particular day she called her parents out for not saying grace before a meal. Not because it meant anything to her, but because it was important for her that they were consistent with what they <laughs> said they believed. <laughs> <laughs> this is great well there's there's so much in today and it it still feels incomplete like I feel like we could talk for hours about the dissatisfactions in ourselves and in the world and um and maybe that's something of the call you know to keep keep exploring it keep nutting it out of what are we meant to do who are we meant to be in this time yeah maybe we can just share like what our takeaway I guess from this conversation is what's your one little one thing that you remember I think I just want to take away that vision of of being that bridge, being that tendon that holds other people, of holding on to those things that are dear to me, my faith, the church, those things, and at the same time holding on to those people who are reaching out for something and I can't quite touch those things yet. Mm, that's good. Um, I think for me, it might be something around just those saints that you offered us that, yeah, we have such a rich history of real flesh and bone people that have struggled with similar things in different times. That image of Augustine as every time he sees the dissatisfaction, just to know that it's it's part of his human condition and it's just pointing him to God. Francis, who, you know, is fiercely for the church but also through his love for God ends up reforming it and Catherine who brings about the work of reform with with such humility that it's never it's never her work it's always in love the love of God poured out for the world 
just as we've done, maybe those listening could just think about, yeah, what's, what's the take home for you from today? Maybe share that with someone this week, just start up that conversation. And I guess one thing going forward, as Kat said, really, is that it, it always starts with us. So yeah, just encourage you to maybe spend some time just asking, asking God where it is he would bring you back into alignment with his love. Until next time, be well. Amen. This has been Contemplating Culture, a podcast produced by the Missionaries of God's Love Sisters. For more information from today's episode, be sure to check out the show notes. We pray that today has blessed you, and most importantly, we invite you to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm.